Me tea, new mug. Bloody warm. Oh, House of Commons or Big Ben mug. Very nice. Um, evening. Uh, yeah, wrongans. Um, lots of people in the body of the Kirk this evening, which is very good. Um, Scotty's Retro Channel. Good evening. Has the guy playing with his organ arrived yet? I've given it a polish. Uh, Andy Turner, fallen asleep. Yeah, probably. I'm, I might have been a minute. Uh, oh, yeah, about a minute late, 45 seconds. Uh, Andrew James, what does Ian Botham and Double A both have in common? They both have big cups. Very good. Uh, so, uh, Dan Payne says, hello, you wrong one. Hayden says, uh, Adrian, bizarre rumours that Kate Middleton is pregnant with Thomas Kingston's baby. Hayden, where did you hear that from? That's like, that is mind blowing. Mind blowing. Um, I'm sure it's not true. I'm sure it's just a scurrilous rumour. Uh, Andy Turner, evening all. What's this I hear about the DWP, Department of Work and Pensions? In court, any information on this? Ooh, Andy. What is it that you've heard, young sir? Uh, and hang on, I'm going to put my tea down. Sorry, my uh, hibiscus. Yes, it is tea. Uh, nearly said coffee. Uh, Napoleon blown apart. Good afternoon, Adrian, from sunny but cold Massachusetts. It's a BJ song. Uh, and uh, uh, happy St. Patrick's Day to you and Mrs. A from Mr. B and Mrs. B. Thank you, Napoleon blown apart. I do appreciate it. I uh, hope uh, you and Mrs. B are keeping well in the good old US of A. We'll be talking about uh, US of A in, in just a little while. We're going to do something new tonight. I know, keeping it fresh. We're going to do, uh, and thank you to my mate Dean, um, who suggested this, said, uh, Adrian, why don't you do a triple A live? And I was like, what, like a battery triple A? He said, well, sort of. He said, why don't you do a triple A? Ask Adrian anything. So we'll make it interactive this evening. You can ask me anything. I'm going to say the, the hellos and um, get allow you to get your feet under the table. GB Patriot, scurrilous rumours about King Willie's affair and child with Rose Hanbury. Oh, it's all kicking off, definitely. Um, we will kind of touch on it. I don't know whether you've seen the live from Wednesday, but I explain the royals and what is going on and my view on what is going on. Uh, at length. It's nothing better than a good length. Uh, Andrew James says, uh, Adrian, don't come the brigadier bit with us, dear. We all know where you've been. Oh, I say. Do you? You can take me. Can't leave me. And the building blown apart. Where? Where? And Hayden says, uh, apparently there is supposed to be a live stream of the court proceedings tomorrow, but all links seem to miraculously have disappeared. Ooh, is that the DWP, Hayden? Um, Rusty Mouse, bring your glasses, folks. I've sneaked a bottle. <laughs> I've sneaked in a bottle of red. Oh, I say, Rusty Mouse, welcome to the body of the cook. Uh, sermon is about to start. Andrew James, uh, Lafitte Rothschild, 1982. Blimey, that's a bit posh, Andrew James. Uh, Rusty Mouse, uh, no more left of that in my fella. Brilliant. Uh, you could afford me. Oh, you, no, that's, you couldn't afford me, dearie. Uh... What's all that going on about? Right, we'll get that past there. Crumpled. Oh, I say, new name. Welcome. All the newbies, uh, make yourself known tonight and I'll uh, I'll give you a mention. I'll say hello. Uh, Crumpled says, uh, evening all. Evening, Crumpled. Uh, hopefully we'll uh, we'll get you um, ironed out at some point this evening. Uh, David Stewart, uh, Paul McKenna, DJ or hypnotist or both. Uh, let's have a think. Can I tell you this? You know that tape I was telling you about? About Jimmy Savile and Fluff Freeman? Paul McKenna was one of them that did it. Jimmy Savile never found out. Threatened to break... I'll break their legs! Whoever it was. Um, never found out because <laughs> the whole industry went, Ooh, no, avoid Savile at all costs. Uh, so, yeah, Paul McKenna knew. Good friends with uh, Simon... Not Simon Callow, that's the actor. Simon What's-His-Face from um, Britain's Not Got Any Talent. 
Evening, Crumpled. Um, there's, there's very odd conversations going on in the chat this evening. <coughs> <coughs> Uh, Andrew James has got a, um, a fixation with my organ. He says, I wonder how long double A takes to polish his magnificent and macro scale organ. Uh, about four strokes. Crumbled. He uses steel, wool and TCP. Oh, you pervert. Um, <laughs> Rusty Mouse says, oh, I'm wincing. Is that Wincing Willis? She used to be a weather girl, didn't she? On ITV. Uh, the Orr Bovril. Evening, Adrian. Evening, Andrew. Andrew says, hello, the Orr. And uh, I think Andrew James may have been in the same Tesco's as I the other day, because as I said on Wednesday, I thought of the Orr Bovril. Um, I, I popped into tes Tesco and seen the Bovril is £4.50 a jar. Oh, at least Dick Turpin wore a mask. Anyway, so... Um, let me just get rid of that. I'm actually uh, being electronic this evening. Yeah, we've had six minutes. So, oh, Retro on his bikes is in the body of the Kirk this evening. Retro, good to see you. Welcome. Uh, Nikki Watson, evening all. Evening, Adrian. Nikki, you're wrong. Uh, retro, just got into port and a phone signal. Bless you, Retro. I hope the, uh, uh, the seas have been rather calm. I know we're getting into sort of uh, the March swell and lots of stuff going on with uh, the water. But uh, I hope the uh, the sailing's been okay for you this time around. Cold winter. Uh, you're a braver man than me. Uh, Nigel Green. Evening, Nigel. Wrongin. Uh, he says, uh, evening, fellow wrongins. Sorry, uh, been absent for a few weeks. Not been well. Think I had Battenberg stuck in a pipe. Oh, I say, Nigel, is that how you take it? Uh, it's a comedy opening. I'm not taking it. I'm being sensible this evening. I'm a blow. The old bottle says, I can't believe it's not butter. No, it's Battenberg. Uh, yeah, it makes things smell. Do you think I should do, like, um, one of these videos at the, at the start of the channel going, Welcome to the Theatre of the Mind. Hope you've brought your Battenberg. I'm now going to explain to you why there's lots of Battenberg references on the channel. Shit me not. Um, Sean O'Connor, hello, what a great game this afternoon, and we won it. What, is that the rugby, Sean? Sorry, I, I've been, uh, I've been a bit busy, uh, today, so, uh, not, I've never watched it or any TV or anything. So, let's get your feet under the table, because we have lots to talk about. So, it's a triple A night, ask Adrian anything, it's brand new, it's a, it's a new idea, that, oh, Meghan Markle saw marketing advantage from Kate's situation to launch brand claims. Schofield? Um, I've just, uh, that alert's just come up. We'll talk about her. And them. Because, um, not that I'm obsessed or anything, but uh, we'll talk about the royals in a, in a second. I need to get your feet under the table, get you into the body of the cook, make sure that the pews are not crammed, and make sure that my collar is set and um, I am ready for the sermon. So next live is this coming Wednesday, 20th, 8 o'clock, 20th of March. I mean, I know they talk about the Ides of March, but it's just flying, flying, flying. Um, uh, Retro on his bike says, ooh, not the seas have been a real bar steward this time. All day, every day, for four weeks. No sleep, earned my leave this time. Ooh. Uh, I feel your pain, Retro. I do feel your pain. Uh, mm. Father was a, uh, a merchant seaman from 14-year-old, sailed all the seven seas, and uh, he said similar to, said similar to you. It's, sometimes it was a, it was just like glass, and other times, whoa, it was like a roller coaster. So uh, good to have you back ashore, Retro. You've definitely earned your your leave. Um, Keep that close. That's just getting to the right temperature where you can get a proper gobful. Um, don't forget, you can follow me on X now. Um, I do, without getting into too much detail at the beginning of the live, um, it is... Uh, X is going to be the everything app. I'm going to try and put some videos up there. Somebody said to me the other day, Hi, Paul. He said, uh, yeah, Adrian, 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 uh, why don't you do one of those live things on X? I'm not sure it's called live, it's called something else, but you know me and technology, so I, I might just uh, might give it a go. Blimey, 
all this work, not getting paid for it. Uh, Nigel Green, was your first dice with radio, hospital radio, and if so, which hospital? Thank you, Nigel. It was known as Auckland Hospital Radio in Bishop Auckland, uh, where the Allen family had uh, a weekend caravan retreat. And I can't remember how, well, with the passage of time, I mean, we're talking, cool, blimey, 44 years ago. I started my hospital radio career. Um, and uh, hang on, I'm just going to write that down because Dale's uh, commented. Um, so I started my radio career at Auckland Hospital Radio. I think it's still going. I think they're, they're on AM or FM or something now. It used to just be piped around the hospital. And uh, what a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous little radio station. <coughs> and literally, the first time that I ever said anything into a microphone on the radio, I literally, my my um, derriere was 50p sixpence, 50p sixpence. Um, all retro on his bikes. Thank you, kind sir. And uh, it was... So the hospital radio, you had to kind of go around the... Uh, Dennis Duncan. Who, who's that, Andy? Um, you had to go around the wards and kind of talk to patients, give them a bit of company. Um, and that was my favourite bit of hospital radio, not necessarily being on air. And and I did, I did some... Uh, some interviews and some starty shows during the week. And for me to get from where I lived in Sunderland to Auckland Hospital Radio was uh, three buses, two and a half hours. It was a nightmare. <coughs> now you can drive it in 20 minutes from where I used to live. But um, so it was hospital radio many moons ago. We'll talk about it in more detail in uh, in a, another live and or another video. Um, but honestly, uh, and, and anybody that's done any professional radio will know this. The minute you flick that switch and you're live, um, it never leaves you. It never leaves your blood. Um, uh, Adrian, what inspired you to get into radio at the very beginning? And was it something you always wanted to do career-wise? Josh, interesting question. Uh, well, I used to listen to, and I understand that James is not very well. I used to listen to... Um, James Whale do a, a late night phone in on Metro Radio. That was my local radio station in Sunderland. And he was the initial inspiration. And I actually spoke to, when I was doing the hospital radio, I actually rang James's phone in. And it was, oh, it must have been half one in the morning. He, he used to do 10 till 2, and it was half one in the morning. My mum and dad were upstairs asleep. And I, I can't even remember. I, I was just filler. I was just talking utter nonsense. Um, but James was was very generous. I mean, he was brutal when he cut me off. But he was very generous. And, and I think it was that taste um, <coughs> that made me want to do professional radio. I just loved the romance of it. I, I just loved... At the time, there wasn't any more than 10 commercial radio stations. I'm talking sort of 79, uh, 80... And there wasn't that many radio stations, commercial radio stations at the time. There was loads of BBC, but BBC was a bit twee. It wasn't me, it wasn't edgy, it wasn't fun. And um, I met a, a very dear friend who I think still does a bit of radio, but he's not in radio really full time. Um, a dear friend of mine, one of the presenters at Radio T's and TFM, and he's, he's been all over the place, Rock FM, uh, Mark Matthews. So Mark was a really young guy. Couldn't have been any more than 12. Uh, did Radio 1 when he was very young, was invited down to Radio 1. Was sort of, his style was more Adrian Just, you know, where they, they took clips, comedy clips, and inserted them into, into radio shows. He used to put so much prep into that. But Mark and I became very good friends <coughs> at the same hospital radio station. And he got a gig at Radio T's in 83-ish. Um, doing something called Street Level, which was from 7 o'clock at night, 7 or 10. And uh, and he invited me in to do various bits and pieces, and I ended up being his gopher. I used to get records out and do all the stuff in the background, uh, do questions for his quizzes, answer his phones while he was on air, and it was all so wonderfully romantic. It, 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 I mean, it was just, it was radio. It was 
big boy radio, it was commercial radio, professional radio, and I was in a professional radio station. <coughs> so if I'd not gone into Auckland Hospital Radio and done my bits and pieces there, like I say, going around the wards uh, and meeting um, meeting the patients was my favourite bit. And there were some old boys in, in the hospital that... Um, so I'd go through uh, to the hospital maybe once or twice a week and I'd go and, and, and see, you know, people that were were in, in challenging situations with their health. But I used to just sit and chatter, chatter, chatter to the old boys. One was a, a gunner in the Second World War uh, and all these stories, these mighty stories. I think it was possibly all that work at Auckland Hospital Radio that made me want to, I've said this to you before, knock on a door any door, and you'll find a story. There, there are just millions of stories on planet Earth, and I just want to start to uncover some of them and bring them to this channel. Because people have some amazing experiences and stories. And I love that about hospital radio, going around and, and um, just taking... Oh, it was uh, uh, Lena Martel one day at a time. Oh, Jesus, the amount of millions of times I've been asked for that. And Engelbert Humperdinck. I mean, it was really edgy stuff. Um, uh, but I just loved talking to folk. And then when Mark went off to, to Radio Tees and uh, got his own show and then invited me to go and work on his show, it was all like, I would say, in flow. I, I, it just happened. And, and maybe I was just right place, right time. Um, GB Patriot. Um, um, is that a... Um, I'll get to that in a... Um, See, the difficulty with your comments is you do them so quickly, Chippy. Um, <clears throat> so firstly, Dale Steele. Call Blimey, Elite's top of the championship. Well done, sir. Very well done. Um, looking forward to them being back in the premiership. I, it, it, has Leicester dropped uh, um Oh, Andy Turner. Uh, yeah, Kenny and Tommy Boyd got me into radio. Brilliant. That's Tommy Boyd without the E, you yeah, Robin. Um, and and who was it at the start? Uh, it was, uh, I would say, James Whale listening to him doing... And, and this is why I believe that <clears throat> late-night radio is a loss to this country. Late-night characters, late-night phone-ins, late-night presenters. It's a real missing, it's a real loss to the whole country. Why? Because... It allowed people a voice. It allowed the voiceless a voice. You could literally just pick up the phone and go, Hello, Adrian. Um, or, Hello, James. And James uh, was on Metro Radio. And my uh, real boss, the program controller at, uh, at TFM, as it became, was a guy called Brian Lister. Wonderful man. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful man. Um, knows radio backwards. He's just brilliant. And... Um, he was James's producer. And Brian once told me a story how they got a recording of James Stanage in Manchester and said to James, oh, James, be more like the other James in Manchester. Um, so there were, there were influences from all over. Whether that story is a, an apocryphal story, whether it's true, I don't know. I just heard, I mean, maybe one day if I get the opportunity, I'll, I'll ask James, so long as he's, uh, please God, his health continues to be well. But... Um, so I would say my my late night engagement was James Whale and Metro Radio. It was just amazing. You could hear there was there was some guy called Sky Dancer that used to come on. Obviously he was off his tits on gear, but he used to come on and was really funny. And and James would have all of these callers who either would come on and say, um, uh, uh, "James, uh, I've got a problem." And, and James would try and help them best they can, or they would talk through things. There would be the, the, the jousting, the political jousting. Um, and I just, I mean, I was still I was still at school when James started doing the, um, the late night phone, or night owls, as it was, uh, which then morphed into uh, Alan Bezik. Alan Bezik came across the Pennines from Lancashire. Oh, he got it tight. He got it very tight. And then <coughs> went back across the, the Pennines, and then Alan Robson. Alan Robson was just, he is mighty, mighty, mighty. Well, Robson, uh, Stanage, Bezik, mighty, mighty, mighty characters 
that you don't just trip over one of them as you're walking down the street. Um, it's they're diamonds that have to be honed, found, honed, polished. It takes quite quite a few years. Some people will start, but then kind of lose interest because there's a lot of work that goes into phonings. A lot of work. <coughs> Oh, Leicester were playing in the FA Cup. Thank you, Dale. Um, enjoy being top of the league. I think that was Gary Chabot, actually. Uh, Josh Ward. I was really hoping for a May election, but it's been ruled out. Yeah, I know. I know. They're now saying June. I mean, they can't, they're just playing with you. They're just toying with you. So James was a bit of an inspiration. Then when I got to uh, Radio Tees, it was like, oh, that was sitting in a radio studio just because you were in a radio station, a big boy radio station, and a lot of... A lot of people who wanted to be on the radio. Uh, who's that saying? Did you find James Stanage? Uh, John Legend. Whale is good. Disagreed with his stance on the jabs, but good. Nevertheless, I agree. Uh, did you find James Stanage? Uh, no, it was a collision of character. It was a, coll a collision of minds. Um, basically, <coughs> we we were bought out by Metro. So Radio Tees was on Teesside. All of Teesside in North Yorkshire. And... Um, Oh, rated Mike Parr. I've, I've worked with Mike. I've worked with Mike at BBC Newcastle, and then he went to BBC Tees. I don't think it was Cleveland at the time. So I've, I've known Mike, God blimey, decades, decades and decades and decades. Uh, and if you know Mike, please say hello to him. It's been a long time since I've seen him. Uh, brilliant. Red 20 Spikes, I'm going to get a few Union flag patches for me jacket and rucksack. That's because GB Patriots says, Adrian, have you heard of the chippy that... Uh, Somebody's had a go at them <coughs> for putting the Union flag up. I agree with you. This, this cancel wokey culture thing is just stupidity of the highest order. Um, basically, what they're doing is they're stopping you having any kind of um, allegiance, any kind of um, pride. Not that pride, this pride. Pride in the flag, pride in who you are, pride in your heritage. Um, they're just, they're playing games with us. I, I think it's stupidity. And we should be allowed to, look, if the Palestinian flag's everywhere, what, what's wrong with, oh, that's it, yeah. The Union flag, it's racist. Um, and you will notice we're calling it a Union flag, not a Union Jack. It's only a Union Jack when it's flying from the Jack staff uh, on a boat. It's always the Union flag. Uh, somebody asked about Steve Allen. Um, yes, Steve Allen, when I, when I worked with him at LBC, just, I uh, love the man. I love, love, love the man. I love his, I love his um, abilities, skills, uh, quick thought. I mean, you know, he was, he was entertaining. Some people didn't like him, but I absolutely, categorically loved the man. Loved his broadcasting, loved his style. Um, and he, in, in my very humble view, very gentle man. Very, very gentle man and sees through all the BS that's around nowadays. Uh, and it's such a shame that he's not doing radio because he's just one of the greatest exponents of, proponents of radio. Uh, Mike Dickens that got me into radio says Wiz Bits. Uh, and I think his name was John Gaunt. Oh, on Talk Sport, brilliant. First class. Let me tell you about Gauntley. So I was doing Century 106 in the East Midlands. And it was very combative. It was very controversial. And I got this email from somebody who said they were at college. And was asking how I was doing stuff and why I was doing stuff. Uh, and that person that said they were at college was John Gaunt. Gauntley, because that's not even his real name. And it was Gauntley that was, oh, Adrian, 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 tell me how you, uh, and, 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 well, um, because my phone-in was, was, if I may be so bold, was very original. It was the very first phone-in in this country ever where we had two people on battling it out on the radio at the same time. So somebody would come in and go, oh, Adrian, Adrian, I'm going to take issue with you. And then somebody else would come in, uh, and ring in and go, Adrian, Adrian, uh, no, I agree with you. So what I would do, um, the, I, I would just sort of I'd ask one question and the other, and there's a, um, 
the technique came from, can you remember the original Hannibal Lecter film? It's called Manhunter. And in Manhunter, um, the FBI agent is interviewing Hannibal Lecter. Now, Hannibal Lecter uh, was, was played by a completely different actor whose name I can't remember uh, off the top of my head. Uh, Neptune Gamer. That's Scotty. You're wrong. And tell 10 to tell 10. Um, Scotty McClue. Dinky do. You're wrong. Um, so in Manhunter, the FBI agent is looking at Hannibal Lecter and Hannibal Lecter is sitting the other side of some bars, jail cell. And the FBI well, FBI agent is talking to Hannibal Lecter. I can see him, but I just can't remember the actor's name. And as the and Jonathan Demi, who directed Manhunter, Rupert, thank you, Brian Cox, great actor, and, and this Hannibal Lecter was really menacing. So the FBI agent was was having conversing with Hannibal Lecter, Brian Cox, and Jonathan Demi said that what he wanted to do was. With every question, um, they would the, the the camera angle would get smaller and smaller and smaller, uh, until there were no bars between Hannibal Lecter and the FBI agent, and I I was really taken with that, and I was doing some bits of radio. I hadn't started my phoning career at that point, but I just thought, Do you know, how can I transpose that technique onto radio? And when I got to Century One Hundred Six. I just worked out that one breath questioning, it's an art. Not many people on the radio have got it nowadays, talking at time either. God blimey, another skill. Um, so when I got, uh, what I did was I would use very short questions and I would get the person that was calling in or the guest um, and I would use these one breath questions to get them into a place where I wanted them, where there was nothing between us. There was, in essence, there was no bars between me and Hannibal Lecter. Um, and nobody had done that before. Ever. On the radio. So it was a brand new technique. And I think that's what John Gaunt was taken by. Um, because I was just, I, I have, still have a love for broadcasting. <clears throat> so... Um, and that's why I want to do more interviews on this channel, because it's it's something that a great interviewer listens. Great interviewer knows the answer to the questions before they ask them. And a great interviewer allows... I mean, I've interviewed uh, David Icke on the BBC, which is possibly one of the reasons why I got uh, let go, as they say, from the BBC. Um but it was Gauntly that, that wrote me that email and I, I explained some of the techniques to him and, and he went off and, um, Guy Harris, name rings a bell. Yeah, I'm sure, I'm sure I've met him. Um, so Gauntly's not doing any radio. I think he's doing maybe some YouTube or something, something or, or, or other. Um, Andy Turner, no, I stopped as I had tongue cancer and it's hard to talk for two hours, but would love to get back into it. Bless you, Andy. Well, hopefully you can do. I mean, there's, there's, there's any amount of space and it's all about, I think, <clears throat> um, it being engaging. I think nowadays with, you know, uh, YouTube and stuff, it's about engaging and adding value to what you're telling people. And that's how we're going to get into tonight. It's triple A. Ask any question and I'll answer them uh, as best I can. Um, ask Adrian anything. And if I don't on the live tonight, any question that uh, I didn't see or I haven't got, I will get to and I will answer them possibly in a second separate video tomorrow or, or Tuesday. Uh, Real Radio, Adrian. Guy Harrison. A mustard on. Sorry, Scotty, which which real radio was he at? Was he in South Wales with me? Or was he in Glasgow? Or was he in North Yorkshire, Yorkshire? <coughs> uh, Rubat Pumpkin said, did you know Dale Winton? If so, did you push his farmers up? 
Uh, no, I never... Well, we kind of had mutual friends because he started in uh, Trent, Nottingham, and I went into Century 106, which was a regional station rather than a city station. It covered Leicestershire, Derbyshire and, and Nottinghamshire. And Albert Metcalf, Matam Zarus. Uh, was Guy Harris? Was he, was he a footy commentator, correspondent, journo? Um, the old bottle, have you managed to make contact with Steve Allen? Not yet. Cool, blimey. Honestly, this, I've got so much to do and too little time to do it in. Um, but I was go what was I going to say? Um, so Dale was at Trent and my boss at Century 106, David Lloyd, who again is a fabulous guy. We all just love radio. I, I, I think and, and anybody that loves radio and loves radio presenting gets it when somebody else has a similar kind of passion. But David Lloyd is uh, running Boom Radio at the moment. And David was my... Uh, was he chief exec or managing director at LBC while I was there? And he was a uh, top dog at Century 106. And, and he knew Dale very well. So, and, and when I went to LBC, Steve Allen's obviously very, very good friends with Dale. So um, Dale's, uh, Dale was talked about sort of in passing by lots of people that I was around. And, uh, and a talent. And loads of money. Oh, blimey. Loads. Um, Stephen Hall, Trent was a great station in its heyday. I agree. I agree. I had a look around once. Um, I mean, it was, so the regional stations were much bigger than the city stations, although in, in the city, this, uh, Trent had primacy until I got into the, the parish and then started to do my thing. I mean, the BBC used to have meetings about me. The, the BBC Nottingham used to have meetings about me because they didn't know. I was on uh, between one and two, and then Bernie Keith was on after me between two and five, I think. Yeah, I was on at one o'clock and finished at two. Then Bernie was on after me. And the BBC didn't know how to combat me because I literally was killing every other radio station. So I went from the, the time slot one till two, 22nd in the market when I took it over. And I nearly got sacked because I went to do mid-mornings, 10 till one, the music presentation, uh, you know, pop and prattle, top 40. And then one till two was a lunchtime phone-in. <clears throat> that was part of the station's remit. And David Lloyd was going to fire me, the tart. He was going, oh, yeah, well, uh, and John Myers, who talked like that, very booming voice, and, and he was like six foot five. He was like, uh, that's wide. I mean, he was just a man mountain of a guy. And he said, no, David, leave him. He's going to be a star. Leave him. So I went from, I took the show from 22nd in the marketplace to second behind Radio 2. I was outperforming every other radio station in that patch, whether it was Derbyshire, Leicestershire or Nottinghamshire. And I once went out, um, and this is just a story. It's just an experience. I don't want you to think I'm suddenly becoming Johnny Big Bollocks. Um, that I went out to a golf tournament and some woman, I was there with Darren Fletcher, who I think works for... Uh, he, he does footy commentary. He did then. He was sports editor. Uh, it was me, Darren, a couple of other lads from the radio station. And this woman came over and really started tearing into me. And I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa hang on. I'm, I'm out for a game of golf, man. Behave. What's your beef? And she said, I can't get my workforce to do anything between one and two while you're on the radio. <laughs> they all turn around and say, no, no, no. We're listening to this. We're listening to this. Because uh, he used to rant a bit. Um, and there was uh, so it was it was great and heady days. It was fabulous and heady days. Um, I think Stephen Hall said I'm, I'm old enough to remember when Radio Trent was Trent three hundred one. That's a while ago, Stephen. Uh, Timmy Hammer. Uh, any thoughts on the current generation of presenters? You seem to focus on the boomer generation, albeit they were legends. Uh, they're shite. They're shite. They've got no... How do I put this? I don't believe they've studied their craft. There's a load of, especially Hart, 
There's a load of radio presenters that have been got that have been get, almost given the gig because they were TV presenters. And TV presenters never, ever make good radio presenters. Ever. I mean, it's a matter of opinion, but I, I've spent 40-odd years honing my craft, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, since 1979. That's 45 years. And... <clears throat> Still learning now. I'm still learning this craft on, on, on YouTube. But radio is a, is a completely different beast. My technique, oh, my, my ears are offended by some of them. Um, oh, sorry, Vivian Darlow. <laughs> Was that a bit too straight? Um, but I, 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 when I'm driving about, I like to just, you know, dial hop and see what's, what's being broadcast. I've heard horrendous broadcasting absolute shite on the radio. It's offensive to me, studying my craft, and then the, these these idiots who obviously have friends in high places or are sleeping with the manager, don't, don't say, oh, Adrian, uh, that happens. Uh, Ian Lee was great and different. I agree, Andy. Uh, Ian is, uh, I just have so much time for, for Ian. Uh, I know he's changed careers now. But uh, And I would love him to come on this channel just to do a bit of anoraking. I mean, when, at one point on LBC, I gave... I mean, he was so gentle, but he was... He's super, super, super intelligent and super sharp. And there was one day... I, I, I can't remember what I was doing. I'd, I'd literally finished my show on LBC, went back to the hotel, slept, got up and went in. And Ian was doing mid-mornings, I think. <coughs> And uh, I can't remember what we were talking about initially, but I said to him, I'll give you some Reiki. I'm a Reiki master, Ian. And he went, what's one of them? I said, well, so I told him about Reiki on the radio and he went, all right then. So I gave him a, a little, because um, uh, he, was, he was talking to me about a Reiki massage. Is it a massage, Adrian? And I went, no, it's not. It's kind of a laying on of hands, Ian. So I kind of went through it. And he was very generous, Ian, with me. Very generous. And I gave him this little Reiki treatment live on the radio, on LBC. Um, and it's, it's for me, it's the way that other broadcasters treat you. Because there's a load of people in radio that would slit your throat rather than look at you. They want your gig. I've, I've had... Uh, so Ian was very generous. Always very generous and uh, and I loved him for it because it was fantastic um Leslie no longer listen to radio it's awful I agree Leslie it's shite um so it's all these the, there are people some people still hanging onto the wreckage at the BBC commercial radio started with GWR great great western radio it was always next 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 and in the studio you would have kind of like a computer keyboard, which had a big green button on it called Next. Uh, and a load of the presenters were just like, Next, Next, Next. No personality. GWR, you can only say this, 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 this. You keep it short. The music counts. <coughs> um, oh, bits. You know a bit. Uh, sleeping with management. I'm not going to name them. But I, uh, uh, I wonder what ever happened to Anna Simons. She was, honest. for me, it's about the audio. It's the quality of the audio. And back in the day, people that worked on the radio had great voices. They had beautifully t a beautiful tone. And now you can hear people on national radio sucking air through their teeth. <laughs> and you think, yeah, pack it in. Yeah, I agree. Stephen, GWR ruined it. But they made a few bob. They made a few bob. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, according to who was the head of GWR? And he wants to stood up and said, I haven't a clue what I'm doing. Um, hang on, who said that? GB. Reiki, you're wrong. GB, Patriot, you dirty tart. What you said now? Uh, Jenny Lacey, little BC. Thank you, Fred Baker. Was a barker. Bad eyesight. Uh is she on now? So my take on, uh, and I, I really didn't want tonight to be just about radio, but um, for me, it's the 
level of engagement you get from the presenter, irrespective of which radio station it is, whether it's national or local, it's all about the engagement. And there was, there was loads of people trying to get into radio because it was kind of a, a shortcut to showbiz, so they thought. And loads of them had crap voices. Like, you couldn't listen to them for three minutes. Uh, ha-ha! You know, that's why Steve Wright took the mickey out of it. Ha-ha! Dave Doubledex. Because those people existed in radio. Um, who's that? And he what? Dermot O'Leary sucks air through his teeth constantly, drives him up the wall. There you go! You, a lot of people that listen to radio, sometimes they don't know why they don't like it. They just know that they don't like it for whatever reason. And it's horses for courses. But for me, it's the tone of the presenter's voice. And back in the sort of 70s and 80s, commercial radio, 75 in this country. Yeah, you got Radio 1 from the, the 60s, but commercial radio, uh, LBC and uh, who was first? Uh, capital LBC, 75, 76, it all exploded. And you can... Like Radio 1, you can... Oh, no, who's that? Jane Owen. Jane, you're wrong -un. Don't take me down that path. God, blimey, I'd rather stick pins in my eyes than listen to her. Again, in my view, horses for courses, but Jesus. Nails down a blackboard is less irritating. Oh. Howard Hughes. Oh, what a voice. What a voice. One of my favourites. Um, you probably have never heard of him because um, he went on to do TV news. A journalist at uh, Radio Tees, as it was. It was clues with the news. Um, and he just had the most... Um, he looked a bit like Grizzly Adams. Booming, deep, resonant voice. Yeah, Gary Davis and Tony Blackburn, completely agree. Great uh, DJs on, on Radio 2. Joanna Lumley, oh, blimey, don't. Um, as in a, in a good way. In a, oh, I mean, she just, um, but except Miriam Margoyles, who did that, uh, was it the Caramel Bar? Um, and it was like, whoa, whose voice is that? And then you find out she's on the other bus. Uh, hang on, did somebody say Clive Warren? Chris, you're wrong. Clive is a fabulous bloke. Fabulous, fabulous, fabulous. I've known him for far too long. Uh, he took me into Radio 1 at one point in the... Must have been the 90s. But um, I don't know where Clive is now. Scott Chisholm, exactly the same. So, uh, Chris, if you know Clive, please send him my regards. Uh, he'll laugh his head off. Uh, who said that? Uh, Clive, um, yeah. Uh, there's a, a newsreader in Scotland called uh, Gwen, oh, I keep thinking Gwen Dickey from Rose Royce, um, or Gwen Guthrie, another, um, but she was the news ed at Talk 107 while I was there, and she's got an amazing voice, amazing. Uh, Robert Francis, Ian MacDonald, Falklands War, Mogadon presenter, oh yeah, well that's what he was hired for, wasn't he? Um, Chris, is he freelancing? Oh, wonderful. Um Clive Warren is is one of those guys, he's very unassuming, but absolutely clued up about radio. Knows it backwards, inside out. Um, I mean, none of us are getting younger, so it's... Uh, he's just a wonderful guy. Can't speak highly enough of him. Uh, Wizbits, Adrian, um, I spent several years working at the Wave in Blackpool, uh, Kit Kat Radio, Blackpool Pleasure Beach. You hear all sorts of rumours and radio scandals. Where's bits? There's loads of them. Loads of them. Who's who's my friend from uh, from Red Rose Radio who went to ru run uh, the wave in Blackpool? <sighs> Honestly, my age. Uh, again, lovely guys. The the real talented ones just can work anywhere, any radio station, whether it's AM or FM. And I, I will tell you this. When I started at Radio Tees in the beginning, we broadcast on FM and AM. And unless you're actually broadcasting on AM, not many people will have done this because the, the, the radio authorities turned around to all the, the, the radio authority, turned around to all the radio stations and said, yeah, you've got to, you, you've got to make dynamic use 
of your AM frequency. And everybody was like, what? Um, and that's where you got all the AM stations from, the, the, um, the gold format. But uh, Roger Day, oh, what a great voice. And so I'd go and do FM on Radio T's. And every now and again... Um, there was obviously monitoring buttons on the presentation desk and I'd click it onto AM because when you open your microphone and you speak on AM, um, it doesn't, if you're weak and not dynamic, it doesn't cut through the AM frequency. It doesn't cut through the, the kind of white noise. So, you know, 252, um, Atlantic 252, the, the, their presenters would know this. Uh and no, I've never spoken to um, uh, Billy and Wally. Hold your plums. Um, but I'm aware of it because I worked at Radio City for uh, a good while. Loved every minute of being in Liverpool. Um, just loved being on Radio City. Just loved it. Anyway, so on on, on AM, you when you open the microphone, you kind of have to give it sort of quarter of a second for you to to get into and through the white noise of AM and cut through. And what that then did, if you did it often enough, when you were on FM where the listener could hear everything, um, you would you could drive the music harder because you had that experience of being on AM and understanding in your ears. So your ears were your eyes, really. You were listening all the time um, and you didn't need to open your eyes. You were just listening to what was going on. And, and these presentation techniques were there for anybody on, on AM. And I, I loved, loved, loved simulcasting on AM and FM on Radio T's. Don't do it now. It's either or. I mean, I, I, I ran, as part of the management team, um, Mohammed Al-Fayed's Liberty 963 in London. That was on AM. Uh, and... Radio is just the most magical experience. If you, if you can engage someone and what comes back to you is either a great story or I was told very early on in my career, if you think you've done the perfect radio show, get out of the industry because at that point, you've lost it. Never, ever, ever think that you've done the perfect radio show because you can always do better maybe in the way you've presented something or the way you've read something or the way you've communicated something there is always more to do there is always stuff you can improve always and that's why to this day 45 years ago i still listen to uh, like the zetland fm dance and soul show that i do on a saturday night i do that for the joy of it i literally don't get paid i do it for the joy of it and to help some of my friends in radio and I just love it. Love it. Uh, who's that? I can remember. Uh, my dad was a DJ. I remember going to hospital radio. Louise, fabulous. Fabulous. Did you ever sit in the studio with your dad? Um, and you, you can almost guarantee, sadly, some people just don't have it. They want to have it and that they want to be able to do it. But the, And they'll give it a good go. But sometimes you just got to admit defeat. It's not... It's not a slight on anyone, but there are others who don't believe they've got it. And you listen to them and you go, what a voice. And it always started with the voice. Who did? Come back to Radio T's. Vivin Darlo. Should I put a call in tomorrow? Um, the Ubovril did 14 years on hospital radio. I bet you absolutely loved it. Because it's not, you know, some of them walk through the door full of ego, think they can do it. They find out very quickly. Other people come in very unassuming. And the minute, uh, Keith Skews, yeah, uh, uh, yes, I did meet Keith. Keith Skews, not Skews. Um, thank you, Pete. Some unassuming people have walked in. I'm not sure. I don't know. Um, uh, you know Mark Dolan on... Is he GB News or Talk TV? G GB News. Um, Mark was at Liberty 963 when I was there. And there was uh, literally every half hour of my day was 
allocated to something. And I was forever trying to teach the, the kids that were coming through. Mark at the time, was, was he 19, 20? He was only a young boy. But absolutely loved radio. Just was like a sponge, just soaked it all up. <coughs> and so I would take him one side and go, right, we're going we're gonna to do script reading today. Because sometimes, and as I say, you can hear people reading a script on the radio and it's so boring and they don't know how to read a script. And yet I can hear somebody reading a script and know that they're just making it sound as if they're having a conversation with you. That's the art. That's the real art. If you've got like a 50 second intro on a song and you go, right, how long is that? Let me just uh, run that. And, and remember, if you're playing music like um, Pop and Prattle Top 40, <coughs> um, sometimes you can hear people that have gone, right, I've got this script. Script takes about 35 seconds. I've got 47 seconds of an intro there. So I'll come out of that. I'll go into the script. They'll do the script as if it's just them talking to you. And they hit the vocal and I, I i can listen to some radio or have done and you just hear the sort of swagger in in the presenter you can just tell they've honed their art and they'll just do this script and they'll just hit the vocal and you just go Fucking hell, that was amazing as a listener but some people kind of switch off and it's just a noise in the background for me it's like a busman's holiday um i i I listen, I don't listen to the music they're playing because my choice in music is, is so eclectic, it's different to what I can hear on a particular radio station. Um, but as I say, like Mark Dolan, if ever you speak to Mark Dolan, Mark Dolan, he'll tell you, I got him talking to time, I had him reading scripts in a certain way, and he knows those skills that I taught him when he was 19 or 20 still stand him in good stead today. I don't know, when, when was this, like 20, 26, 27 years ago? In fact, I left, Diana died in 97 and I left early 98. Uh, and at, at that time, um, so I can, when I'm, when I'm catching up with Mark, whatever he's doing, whether it's TV, Channel 4, or whether it's GB News, I can still hear some of the techniques that I taught him 20 odd years ago. And it's wonderful because it's, it's like being in service of other people. It's like some of the stuff that I, I bring to, to YouTube. I want to give you stuff that nobody else can because they don't have my insight. A bit like, if you've not watched it yet, go and watch the Ben Gurion Canal video that I did back in November. Blimey, there's five months ago and people are still distracted. And, well, we'll get to it in a second. I'll get, I'll get to some of the stuff that... Um, Stephen Hall, I can talk about radio all night. Stephen, I, I can out-talk you, definitely. Um, because it's such a magical, magical medium. It's not like telly where it's there and you can, you, you've can you got to be focused on it there. But radio, it's portable. You can take it in the car, you can walk around with it, you can be in the garden and have something on in the background. Uh, who said that? Scotty's Retro Channel. Have you ever worked in TV, Adrian? Uh, yeah. So you know the Jeremy Vine show on Channel 5? Don't think I've ever told him this. You know the Jeremy Vine talk show on Channel 5? Can you remember when uh, Wrighty presented it? And there was all that hoo-ha around John Leslie. I may have told you this before. So I'm, I'm living in, in Nottingham at the time. And... I get this email, this random email saying, eh, eh, we'd, uh, we'd like to uh, screen test you for, uh, for uh, telly. And I was like, what? So I literally just sent them a very straight email. Fox Rod Oscar, if you say who you say you are, here's my mobile number. Literally within 30 seconds of sending that email, I get a phone call. Uh, hello, my name is Jonathan Sashidoshi from some production company in, in London that produced this mid-morning talk show on Channel 5. And I was like, right, Jonathan, what do you want? Eh, will you come down and do a screen test for us? And I said, no. And he said, please. I said, look, what is it that you want? 
And he said that it hadn't quite hit the fan, but Wrighty had named John Leslie. They were scared that John Leslie was going to sue him, but they both had the same manager. And if John Leslie had sued him, uh, he was going to have to be taken off air. So they were looking for somebody to fill his shoes. So I was like, all right, then I'll come down. When do you want me to come down? So I went down, um, did this screen test, did some kind of, took some callers uh, in, in their studio. And it was at the actual studio. I'm sure it's the actual studio that Jeremy Vine's broadcasting in now. And, uh, and it was in the lap of the gods. So they wanted me. They had me set up to take over, but John Leslie never sued him. Thank you, Andy. Love you too. And D Ford, Wizbits, D Ford, the pub cleaner. So I nearly had the, the Channel 5 mid morning to, I mean, it, it, it. so John didn't sue him. Um, he stayed, right, he stayed for a few more years and, um, and then left. And uh, Jeremy got the, got the gig, but almost, almost full time telly. Listen. You could have put photographs of me over the fireplace. Would have kept the kids away from the fire. Um, brilliant. Napoleon blown, Napoleon blown apart. Says Terry Wogan nicked my bike at a charity footy match and then got me every DJ's autograph. Fabulous. Fabulous. You see, it's all these... Um, I mean, I've met some grumpy celebs in my time. Some proper grumpy celebs. You know the two singers with, uh, with the Human League? Oh, he interviewed them once. <sighs> Didn't broadcast it. In the end, I was just like, <laughs> close the microphone. Right, girls, thanks very much. See you later. And the, 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 the rep from the record company was like, Adrian, 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 what's wrong? What's wrong? What's wrong? Um, and I was just like, it's like getting blood out of a stone, man. We both know what the game is. I'm just asking them really easy questions to bat away. They don't have to do much. Just give me three minutes, then I'll stick with their, the new tune and we'll just, uh, we'll play it. Oh, will you, do you mind doing it again? So I said, tell him, I just want three minutes. I just want some shite, man. Tell them what the game is, if they don't know what the game is, or if their egos are too big. Anyway, we, we started again, and they were just the same. So I literally did about 120 seconds, 150 seconds, and I said, girls, right, we've got enough, thanks very much. We'll play your song. Go off. Go I'm trying to think of some others. Um, incense and peppermints. Who was that? Um, Mark E. Smith. Bricks E. Smith. Oh, dear God, the record company. So I was doing the kind of an evening thing at TFM. And Bricks E. Smith came in with her, um, with representing her, her band. I can't remember at the time. I still got the vinyl. And she came into the this this tight little booth that we had where we, we, we were doing uh, the interview and the record company rep was sitting next to her and she literally pulled her knees up to her chest and wouldn't answer any of me questions. And I was like, Bricks, it's, honestly, this is, this is just gentle. Uh, all I want to do is I just want to play your vinyl to help you and the record company out. The fall, brilliant. Thank you, Adam. Um, and yeah, that was Mark E. Smith's band, but her band, was it The Fall? But anyway, um, it, was, it was one of the most painful, painful, painful interviews I've ever had to do. One of the most painful interviews I've ever had to do, but it was a simple joy, was Paddy McAloon. Paddy McAloon from, um, oh, I can't remember his band now. But Paddy was so shy. I mean, I was happy just to take my time and just kind of bat some stuff that I thought he might be interested in. I'd done a load of research for the interview because I was told by the record company that he was he was a bit shy. He, he didn't really want to be famous um, and prefab sprout. So Paddy McAloon was just, it was a joy. A joy. And I loved it. Um, and... But there were others. So Paddy is a very shy guy. I love doing the interview. I might have it on 
recorded somewhere. But um, these are all sort of 80s. So from, from sort of 84 through to 96, I was literally interviewing anybody that was around then. Uh, Madonna, Oasis, cool, blimey. They would all just come in the radio stations and you just kind of go, oh, hello, lads. Uh, right, okay. Um, Danny Minogue, I once gave her a hug. And there was a guy standing behind her. I didn't know who it was. Les Ross, great presenter. Started at Radio T's, went to BRMB. BRMB. Um, Les Ross is a great, 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 great presenter. Um, so I gave Danny a hug. And there was like this big guy, this good looking swine behind her. Um, and so I was just all, you know, I was all starstruck with Danny. Because she was very pretty. Um, and so we go in, we do the interview, he stays outside, we come back out, get a, get a great big hug, brilliant Danny, thanks very much, uh, and the record company were really pleased, um, so I said to the record guy, so they, they went out and got into their, their vehicle, their chauffeur driven vehicle, and I said to the record company guy, I said, who's that, who's that, that guy, um, and it was Danny's husband, and I'm giving her all the hugs. Um, and he wasn't he the Australian Prime Minister's son? And then he went on to have like a really huge TV series in the in the noughties about the uh, the plastic surgeons. Uh, can't remember the Prime Minister's name because I would get his name. Um, but I, you know. It's just, it's the game. It's what we do. I go down to interview somebody at EMI Records. And the first first thing I said, uh, it, um, was it Manchester Square? So I, I said to the the, the, um, the record company guy, ear, ear, ear. I'll do it, I'll do it. I'll come down to Manchester Square, I'll do it. But you've got to take me there. And he went, I knew you were. Julian McMahon, that was it. Thank you, Annie Watt. Julian McMahon, good looking guy. Um, comparatively taller than me, um, but I, di I didn't even know it was a husband. I'm always a gentleman. I was losing my mind with Danny. Um, so I, I went down to interview somebody at EMI Records and I just said to, I said to the record guy, <coughs> record company guy, will you just let me stand there for a millisecond? Like, right, okay, do the interview and then I'll take you there. So you know the Beatles banister where they're looking over? They did a couple of uh, album covers with that shot. Um, and I just, honestly, I just wanted to stand where John Lennon stood. I did the same when I did, um, when I went to the recording studio, Abbey Road. Um, but literally, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up when I was standing on. And I had to walk through an office full of secretaries who were just doing the do, doing the job, doing whatever, taking away. Um, and he just, he opened these double doors to this, uh, this ledge and uh, just one of the most magical things. Magical, magical, magical. A, a privilege. I, I didn't... I loved doing the interviews with uh, some of the artists, but being allowed to, um, to stand where the Beatles stood and John Lennon stood at EMI Records, Manchester Square. I don't think it's there anymore. Have they knocked the building down? I don't think EMI Records is there anymore. Um, it's okay, Adrian. Marriage didn't last long. I tell you, Viv, it's probably my fault. Um, so let's get into some of the... You, uh, you literally have had me talking about radio for an hour. You utter wrongings. I know it was a triple A. Ask Adrian anything. You could have asked me other stuff. Um, Howard Stableford, BBC Radio Northampton. And then Tomorrow's World. Oh, of course. Yeah, my mate Bernie. Bernie Keith, he's on BBC. Uh, not, is he BBC Northampton? I'm sure. Russian President Vladimir Putin claims fifth term in inevitable election landslide. <laughs> oh, dear. Yeah, so uh, Vladimir Putin, he's God, basically, in Russia for however long he wants it. Um, and he wants the gas and oil uh, out of the Black Sea. Anyway, um, I forgot to compliment the legendary Battenbergers at the beginning of the live. Adrian. Manners. Uh, so to Rich, he just wanted to say a simple thanks, Aid. Rich, appreciate it. Uh, have I? Oh, what have I done with him? Uh, I think, finally, I think it's Rambo. Finally, 
I've got the, the Jiffy bag to send you the Top Man tape CDs. So uh, they'll be they'll be being posted. Um, Putin secures another term as president, lambasted by the West, but the Russians love him. They love him. Um, have you, I wanted to say this, uh, Dan Payne, it's good to see you rambling on, you're wrong. Dan, you smooth talking bastard. Uh, Louise Sampson, Bernie Keith is still on Radio Northampton. Louise, if you speak to him or just say, Adrian Allen says hello. He mentioned you on YouTube the other night. Love Bernie to bits. Love, 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 love Bernie to bits. Talented guy. Super, super funny. Um, I mean, there's there's a couple of lines that I haven't brought here, but he, um, uh, what was his line? He'll tell it better than me. But this is one of the funniest lines I've ever heard on radio. And it was Bernie's. And he, he was just talking randomly about stuff. He said, oh, yeah, I spent the morning um, doing my housework. I love doing the housework. I live on my own, but I was doing my housework. He said, I was doing all this hoovering and I was dusting. He said, but I, I prefer uh, I prefer doing the hoovering than the dusting. He said, because there's nothing better than getting a good upright in your hand. Bernie, you tart. And still to this day. He made me laugh out loud when he told that. I nearly crashed the car. Um, any Belfield gossip, Adrian? Uh, I can tell you that I don't believe a word that I'm being told. I think, am I going to do something? We'll rattle through some of this um, because I want to talk about... It's a, the subject's a bit dry, but it needs to be... Um, I need to tell you this because there's... Uh, let me just do it in order. Let me get through it. I'm probably around for another 20 minutes or so. And here, you're wrong uns. There's so many people watching this and they haven't smashed the likes. God blimey, are you punishing me tonight or something? So if you haven't smashed the likes, do the thummy thing, please. Um, because seemingly, the algorithm, if you get lots of likes and lots of comments... The algorithm goes, oh, that's quite popular. We'll, we'll have that go out to lots of other people. Um, have you heard of something called what three, what three Words? It is, in my view, and I've known about it for donkey's years. I've known about it for, call blimey, 10 years. Um, and What Three Words? You know, sometimes if you get lost or uh, sometimes you are somewhere and you think, oh, I'm lost. Or um, say there's been a car crash, and, and this has happened to me. I witnessed a car crash in North Yorkshire, and uh, and I rang the police and went, oh, here, yeah, there's a bad smash, three cars, uh, southbound carriageway of the A19. Where are you? I'm on the A19. No, 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 where are you? And I'm looking around. Uh, well, I'm the third tree from the left. Well, we need to tell our officers where they need to go. Um, Rusty Mouse, you know, I agree. Um, so I was like, well, I'm, uh, I've been driving for about 10 minutes past this town and I think I'm coming up to this turn off and I wasn't sure at all. <coughs> but what three words is brilliant. So you put the app on your phone and, and, and what three words is everywhere on planet Earth is covered by three metre squares. And each square is allocated a word. And you get three separate words. So, uh, I don't know. Uh, Adrian, radio, Twitter. So there would be the three words. And those three words would be allocated to a square so the emergency services can find you. So say you go out for a walk somewhere and somebody falls over and injures themselves. You're in the middle of nowhere. You don't. You can call ambulance or police or coast guard and you don't know where you are. Or you are lost and you've got very little charge left in your phone. You can send somebody a text with the what three words and they can call for the cavalry and get to you because the emergency services have all used this for years and years and years um but if you ever get stuck it's fabulous in many different situations so if you haven't got it on your phone what three words just download it get it on your phone 
And um, wherever you are, it'll give you three words. Three meter squares. Wherever you're sitting, it'll give you three words. Um, GB Patriot. I'm not going to read that out because that'll tell everybody where you are. You're wrong. Um, <laughs> Jim Atkinson. I bet Tail Block Tracy is that tits pub bike. Funny ass. Uh, Andy Turner. RNLI use it at sea. The police forces use it, especially in like Police Scotland. They'll use it their terrain, and people can uh, can say, uh, I "Don't know where I am." Describe what you can see. Uh, green. So, are, are you near a mountain? Well, I think so. It's a bit hilly here. How long have you been walking for? About four or five hours. From where? So you could be within a hundred mile radius. But what three words is exceptional and maybe your kids will do a lot of walking or your grandkids or, or you for that matter um just stick it on your phone because you never know when you need it you just go into the app and it just gives you exactly where you are um sean piper nice big brother can nab you for shouty hurty words easier that'll be the self-admitted liar then in a court of law he told the world i lied that's Alex Belfield. Hurty words, my hairy backside. He's a self-confessed liar in a court of law. Um, I don't know whether you know this, but... Uh, brilliant. Uh, Chris Mundy, Houses of Parliament. Three words, money, sucking, clowns. Sucking being the operative. Uh, Dan Payne, it was uh, offered to Richard Vobes to do an interview... Uh... Oh, right, okay. Um, Steve Harley passed away today, sadly. And there seems to be a lot of this. Steve Harley passed away after a short fight with cancer. Turbo, anyone? Uh, some of his, some of his music, remember Judy Teen? Mr. Soft, he did a cover of the Beatles' Here Comes the Sun. George Harrison's Here Comes the Sun. But everybody quotes, make me smile, come up and see me. Uh, but I, I think uh, Mr. Soft, Judy Teen, Here Comes the Sun, I've played them all on the radio, all of them, for decades. Uh, and it's, it's a sad thing that he passed away. Uh, but there just seems to be a lot of this kind of thing happening now. And nobody's ever giving us any answers. Um, are you the same as me? When Whenever I think about the Royals, and it's just, there's loads of it around, um, whenever I think about the Royals, yes, Jane, it was a very short illness. Um, Louise Hampson, love Steve Harley, RIP. Yeah, great, unique voice. Um, the Royals, I, I th this... I haven't made my mind up yet. I mean, Hayden, right at the very beginning, uh, said, oh, yeah, Catherine's uh, uh, pregnant. Um, but there's all these rumours and supposition going around, and um, people are just making stuff up now. But every time I think about the royal family, can you remember the, the, the TV show, Soap? Can you remember that TV tune? I can't play it on here because um, I'll get a copyright strike from uh, YouTube. I just keep hearing the theme tune to Soap because that's what it is. It's a So at the beginning of Soap, it's the story of two sisters. One's quite wealthy, other one's struggling a bit. Um, and it's the stories of all the different characters. Uh, huge in the 80s. But every time I see another royal story, I just hear... Dee, 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 dee. And no, I can't sing for Toffee. But it's, it's two brothers. It's not two sisters, it's two brothers. And one will be king, the other is insanely jealous and wants to be king too. I just, all of it. Um, oh, who's that? Mr. John Up. Brilliant, Mr. John Up. Thank you. I used to love your intro music by the propeller heads. Spy break. Oh, ho, ho, ho. me too. Me too. I've had a couple of different um, 
theme tunes. I used uh, Ronnie Jordan's So What for the late night phone in, in the northeast. And then when I went to Real Radio in South Wales, we used uh, Propeller Heads, Spy Break. Uh, and then when I went to LBC, sorry, Talk 107 and a bit of LBC, we used uh, the lead singer from Manchester Band. Oh, come on, Adrian. I can see him. Uh, I won't think about it. It'll come back to me. It was called You've Got the Fear. Oh, very evocative. Uh, Monkey Boy, can't remember his name. Uh, Chris Mundy, Kate's uncle, let it slip in BB Celeb. Did he, Chris? What, the Kate's up the duff? Ian Brown, thank you, Adam. Ian Brown, what a, what a, what a great song, a late night song that we used as a uh, instrumental as remix as a, the intro to the, the LBC show. Love it, love it, love it. And it's really important that you get... Uh, Retro says, uh, are we looking at another royal divorce? Well, I, I won't name names, but there's uh, a royal family in Europe where something really weird going on. The, the missus, like the queen, which is not queen, is get out of off. And people were thinking she was losing her mind. Stone roses. Thank you, Dan. And the saying, um, I don't know whether... You've heard this retro or Chris the saying that the the Royals are going to make a statement in the next 72 hours. It's the next three days. So by the time we get to Wednesday, I'll do the Wednesday live at eight o'clock and it'll all be, uh, they've said now, they've said now. Or Willie's taking another photo and he's uh, still photoshopping it. So I don't, um, it's just a soap opera. It's a distraction. It's a diversion from what's really going on. And that's all the, that, that, that somebody actually totaled up their wealth and they said that they're worth about 28 billion whoa more than that god blimey their artworks are worth more than that and their their stones in their crowns and jewels worth more than that so i don't know whether they're going oh we're impoverished we're an impoverished royal family we're only worth 28 billion my airy backside um are you aware of the, the mike tyson jake paul thing and it's kind of blowing up. It's not till July in one of the, uh, is it the Dallas Cowboys Stadium? And I've said this before. So Jake Paul's 27, Iron Mike's nearly 60. And if he, the first, the first thing to go for a professional boxer <coughs> with some age is the resistance to a punch. You can take George Foreman out of that because he was 45. But, you know, Tyson's another 15 years on from that. Fitness levels, oh, how's he going to get? I mean, what's Jake Paul going to do? Dance around while uh, Tyson starts um, slinging bombs at him, just avoiding him for the first two or three rounds and then takes him out? Um, or the reflexes. I mean, Tyson was literally a killing machine. Baddest man on the planet. Killing machine. But what a fighter. What a... So it's... One of two things is going to happen. So Jake Paul beats Mike Tyson, say. So he gets lambasted for beating up an old man. Or Jake Paul loses to Mike Tyson. And they're going to say, well, he's lost to an old man. End of his boxing career. Uh, I'm with you, Chris. Still think Tyson will smash him if he has uh, a genuine go at him. Seen Tyson in training. He looks sharp. But... 57, 58. How long is he going to last for? Now, I'll give you an example because we've all seen it. Remember that little video of the, the guy, the drunk on the plane who was just having a go, having a go, having a go. And in the end, Tyson's just turned around and gone, clump, here, Oxford Oscar, bang. But I saw him chucking the, chucking the bombs it didn't look great. But then again, he's not been in, he, he wasn't in training at that point. So I hear they're going to use head guards. They're going to use 18-ounce gloves. Now, when I was boxing, 12-ounce um, was, was as much. 14-ounce, God blimey, my arms felt like lead weights. But 18-ounce gloves. I mean, Tyson's going to dig a bit. Jake Paul? It's all, and we're still months away from the fight, and it's going to hype up and hype up and hype up. 
but how much are they making? Nobody's talking about the money. How much are they making? Netflix paying them millions, no doubt. But if Tyson, Mike Tyson, Iron Mike, gives it his go for, say, three or four months for a few mil, <coughs> would you be Jake Paul? Now, I've seen, you know, the bit where they're eyeballing each other. Tyson is just... Can you remember that very famous? I don't know. I don't think it was Terrell Biggs. I can't remember. Tyson was literally just doing that. He was just watching whoever it was that was in front of him. Um, because the other guy was kind of dancing about. Tyson just stood there and just did that. And then got stuck into him. So... I love this new version of, of Iron Mike. I mean, he, he had a torrid time in the 80s. Robin Givens and her mother. And then Jail. Um, I mean, he's led 10 lives. But I like this newer version because he's he's older, he's wiser. And he's he's saying, I remember seeing him on a, on a podcast and he said, sometimes I get in my head and I think I'm somebody. And get easily offended. But when I know that I'm nobody, I could never be offended. I mean, how beautifully deep is that? And humble. I'll say it again. Mike Tyson said, sometimes I get in my head and I think I'm somebody and get easily offended. But when I know that I'm nobody, I could never be offended. Um, and he, he said in the past, I, I mean, I love this this version of uh, Iron Mike because he's he's found peace with himself. And he says, God doesn't expect you to be perfect, just humble and honest. And uh, and one of his famous quotes, and I think this will apply to Jake Paul. Everybody's got a plan until he gets hit in the face. I mean, I, I, I so the eyeball with Tyson, that's what I was going to say. Tyson's looking at him. And Jake Paul, very interestingly, has turned slightly away from Tyson. His head's there, looking at Tyson in the eye. But his body language, he's scared, witless. He's just, his body's twisted. And you know he's uncomfortable. Tyson knows that. Tyson's been in with some incredible punches. But has he still got it? Can't wait, literally can't wait. And I do hope, as somebody uh, commented, that uh, Tyson's going to give Jake Paul a, a boxing lesson. I, I was watching Carl Froch a little earlier, and Carl Froch has said, nah, Tyson's going to give him a lesson. He's going to give him a lesson. Because although Tyson might be slightly slower, his reactions might be slightly slower, um, and he might not be able to take the punch that he did. I mean, his neck in the 80s was like the size of one of my thighs. It was just... Mm, um, I think the whole world, if Tyson wins, he's doing it for boxing. He's doing it for the boxers, not MMA, boxers. Um, Chris Mundy, what about Tyson Fury? I've got, Fury, I've gone off him recently. I think a lot of people have. He's, he's going to have to come out against, against Usyk, and he's really going to have to be on the, the top of his game. Is he too old? Has he left it too long? AJ is looking sharp, but, I mean, Ngannou, well, AJ had more than enough for him. Fury didn't treat Ngannou as serious. He just kind of took the money and run, really. Uh, but Usyk is a different calibre of fighter. So I think they've got a match and a return clause in the contract. So by the time he's fought Usyk twice, hopefully hasn't lost. Um, it's AJ. AJ versus Fury. What a night that's going to be. Um, I think the old Tyson has got too much for AJ. I think AJ's in his head. Uh, it just depends who turns up on the night. Um, who said that? Rusty Mouse said Jake has been mocking Tyson. Wrong thing to do. Absolutely the wrong thing to do. Because Tyson's just going to laugh. He's been in with some very, very, very hard man. Um, was it Green, the, the, the drug dealer from his, his, his local? And it was a very tasty fight. But Tyson was, was, was on it. 
was proper on it. And that green guy, the drug dealer, was a um, was a local hard man, was a very, very hard boy, but Tyson still did him. And all the, I get the Holyfield biting the ear, I get all that. He was frustrated. And, I mean, just the way he took people out. Now, uh, I think Jake Paul's slightly taller than him. Yeah, I've nearly got 100 thumbs up. Thank you. Oh, Bovril. Mitch Green. Thank you, GB Patriot. I thought it was a great fight. I really enjoyed it. Tyson had him, though. Tyson was proper landing bombs. Um, so, Jake Paul's a little taller than Tyson. Perfect for an uppercut. Perfect. So, I look forward to it. Look forward to it. Are you aware of uh, Holly Weird exploding? There's this story that won't go away. And it's... Look, there's unspoken rules in Hollywood. I think uh, if you're watching the P. Diddy story and uh, the Usher and uh, other things, it's interesting. But Hollyweird has, uh, has blown up. There's, there, there are those unspoken rules. You've got to be nice to everybody because, uh, you know, if, if you're on the coming up, then you'll meet them coming down. But Sharon Stone and Billy Baldwin, it's like proper kicking off. Um, she said... She was asked by a director to sleep with Billy to pep up their Sliver movie. And Billy said, uh, hang on a second, what do you mean? Sharon Stone still hurt because I rejected her. And then a director's come out and said, uh, yeah, and chucked Brad Pitt into the mix. And Billy has said, uh, yeah, I know loads about her. She didn't want me talking about her. And this is like, this is unknown. In Hollywood, Hollyweird. Because they don't they don't attack each other. They never do. But it is. What do you make? I talked about the Royals and um, the soap theme. What do you make of Megan Markle? Launching her lifestyle brand an hour before Prince William stands up to give a speech about his uh, the 25th anniversary of his, his mum's charity. No class. Her, not him. So she's taking full advantage of Catherine being out of the public eye. She wants to come back to the UK. She's high, she's trying to find a PR for her to come back to the UK. Here, mate, Foxtrot Oscar, we don't want you. No, we don't want you. I saw something, uh, who was it? Uh, I'll leave it for another Wednesday. I just saw something and I need, I need to get the, the quote accurate. Um, but as I said on Wednesday, I went through all of this in great detail. There's a power play going on here. It's Meghan and Harry. They want William and Catherine gone. Gone. It's, it's a story as old as time. Yeah, as Theo Bovril says, she's exactly how the uneducated behave. I mean, she's a pretty smart girl. Zero class, zero shame, zero persona. Oof, Annie what? I agree with you. Um, but William can't even bear to be in the same room as Harry's video link. Because William, I mean, he's going to be the future king. But Harry, I've said many, many times, is insanely jealous. He wants, he wants William gone. He wants Catherine gone. And if you look at what they're doing in the press. So uh, the Yacht Girl uh, launches a lifestyle brand. An hour before William stands up to give a speech. Now, I am sure that they get the court circulars in Montecito. They're aware of what's going on because she knew that Harry had a video link to talk about his mum's 25th anniversary of her charity. Foundation. And she wants the people of this country to love her. That's never happening in a month of Sundays. And, and online, you can't really say this because you get attacked by idiots. But I don't think this... Knowing the way the Brits are and some of the principles that we live our lives by in this country and this septed isle, we don't want anybody like that here. I mean, we had Princess Pushy a few years ago. Remember her? She was uh, at it. And then some of the other lesser royals further out um, oh, what's that Neptune game? A basketball groupie. Tell me more. Um, 
Oh, yeah, Stuart, so much for, we want privacy, we want privacy. We want privacy until we tell you that we don't. Um, and here's the thing. This is a thing. Harry's African charity faces a new killing and torture allegations. Now, the allegation is that ranges from uh, the charity of which Harry is a director. The charity um, ranges from the charity raped and beat tribes people. And Harry's done nothing. Nick's not a nout. Chris Source. That's interesting. Um, the Oh My God Photoshop pictures H&M put out and never got questions. Have you seen the Brillo pad on his head? I keep mentioning this. So I, and, and I would say to him, because he took the mickey out of William's bonds for years. Just submit to it, Harry. You've got a Brillo pad uh, or um, Weetabix on your bonds. Just let it go, man. And their Photoshop stuff. I mean, making Harry look as if he's got loads of ginger hair. What's he had it? Transferred from his spherical's. Don't know why I was looking down there. I just, I, I, I laugh my cap off. South Park was funny. I agree, Retro. It was fabulous. And when you've got the comedians actually nailing it, there's no comeback from that. No comeback whatsoever. Um, another thing, uh, if you haven't seen it before, and I can't really put a link on here, I can't say there's a little square in the corner to the Ben Gurion Canal video. Look at that video on this channel, because we were telling you back in November. Um, so I want you to now consider, if you haven't seen the video, go and watch it at, at your leisure. But I want you to now consider that the Americans have said they, they're creating a temporary humanitarian port. The US government is constructing it under full Israeli supervision. Why, why would I tell you that? Go and have a look at it. Because it aligns perfectly with the path of Netzerim Corridor. Now, about a week or so, 10 days or so ago, the Israelis bulldozed a really wide road that dissected the north and south of Gaza. And I've told you that what's going on is Netanyahu is evil. And Netanyahu is staying as a war president. That's why they said they were at war. He can stay as a war president for as long as he wants. Prior to October the 7th, the Israelis wanted him gone. They wanted him out of office. So he's sitting there. And what are they doing with this Netzarim corridor? It's so that they can build... Um, a humanitarian port. <coughs> so the humanitarian aid is coming out of Cyprus across the East Mediterranean to a port that's at the end of this Netarim corridor. Why would they want to do that? Because the gas and oil that is under the East Mediterranean and under Gaza, there are trillions of cubic metres of gas under Gaza and billions of barrels of oil. It would make Israel very wealthy nation. The Americans want in on the act. They want in on the Benjamins. So they're building the humanitarian port at the moment, but you, I, I will guarantee you, maybe I will have shuffled off this mortal coil by this point, but I'm telling you now, mark my words, and please correct me if I'm ever wrong, this humanitarian port is going to morph into a port for the oil and gas industry. It's a two kilometer wide road and a buffer zone, this Netzerim corridor that uh, secures North Gaza, Northern Gaza from the rest of the Gaza Strip. And nobody's questioning that. Oh, I was gonna show something to you. So remember, I have been telling you since 2023 in December, I said to you that 2024 is gonna be 2023 on steroids. And then I said to you, watch out for the Black Swan event. We didn't know what it means. We don't know what it's going to be. So have you seen 
the mail on Sunday today. Now I'm going to have to duck. I'm going to see if I can. Hang on. Can you see that? Not even a black swan event can rescue the Tories now. So I've been telling you since January that it's going to be a black swan event. That's going to. So 9 11 was a black swan event. 7 7 black swan event. Uh, October 7th, Black Swan event. It's the unexpected. And so I've been telling you for four months, five months, it's a Black Swan event. And now the Mail's saying not even a Black Swan event is going to save the Tories. <sighs> Have they been watching this, my lives? So they've got the Ben Gurion Canal and infrastructure being put in place for the oil and gas industry. And that's why Netanyahu doesn't want to go anywhere. Chip Adkins and Aquarians rule. Uh, the Mail have been tuning in to your live shows. The old Bovril. I wish they'd give me half their bloody money. Harry makes more money out of the Mail. I, I buy it. I don't make money. Um, I want you to keep an eye on something. America. Um, uh, America's... And, and I think the Black Swan event might actually happen in America. Um... I, I, I wish Donald Trump well, but I'm very nervous for him. Very nervous. Because the OCG, Organised Crime Gang, Biden, they've got communist rule in America. China owns all their debt, about well, 60% of their debt, which is trillions. Interesting. Uh, a near-death experience to wake the sheep up like a nuclear threat. Well, Putin said, lads, pack it in. If you do any more, I'm going to nuke you. I'm going to press the button. And the Americans are going, oh, hang on, Vladimir, man. It's all right, you'll be president again. And you can have crime here, because there's a load of oil and gas under there. So what this all, what this all is about, these are all bankers' wars. This is all about energy independence, whether it's America and the Caspian Sea, because three days after 9-11, Putin was at George Bush's ranch organising the American-Russian pipeline out of the Caspian Sea down down to a warm water port in Pakistan. Nobody talks about that. But it's energy independence. It's oil and gas. All of it. Whether it's the um, East Mediterranean and Gaza, whether... It's the Black Sea, and you've got Turkey and Bulgaria and Crimea. Um, that's what it's all about. It's, and when you know that, it's easy to watch all the distractions and all the diversions, and you can work out what the politicians are doing. They're feathering their own nest. Um, so watch out for the Black Swan. I think it's going to be possibly in America. But America at the moment... It's weird, really. I mean, they're trying every which way to just squash Trump every which way, whether it's politically or whether it's the courts or whether it's financially, fining him half a billion dollars to take all of his liquidity out. There are some very powerful people that, A, are not happy with Trump, but are less happy with Biden. And have you noticed the court case with Hunter? It's gone very cute. Um, I'm going to give you something that I know you don't know. Ever heard of a woman called Ghislaine Maxwell? I'm being facetious, of course. Are you aware of Ghislaine Maxwell? Jeffrey Epstein's Palamore. Well, she's spending time in jail. Ghislaine Maxwell got 20 years, I think. She's in a low security uh, prison to serve her 20 years. And she got sent down for procuring teenage girls to be abused by Jeffrey Epstein. Have you been looking at her brothers and sisters and what they do? I'm going to give you a name. Isabel Maxwell. Heard of that one? We all know Ghislaine. So who is Isabel Maxwell? She's Ghislaine's sister. Obviously. Captain Bob's daughter. But why would I be mentioning her? She is the technological 
director of the World Economic Forum. Can you see how deep the rabbit hole goes? Are they Mossad? They reckon the Captain Bob was. Robert Maxwell. Technological director of the World Economic Forum. Klaus Schwab, you will own nothing and be happy and eat bugs. Mossad. I'll leave that with you. If you don't, uh, don't ever hear from me again. Um, can I just mention children in need? It is very, very important. It's a BBC. We never, we, we never see where the money goes. 38 million raised on Friday, but previously it's been over 100 million before. So Lenny the Unfunny is no more for children in need than his last on Friday. Au revoir, mate. Au revoir. Thank Christ. Lenny the Unfunny stepping down. Funniest thing I'd heard him say in decades. Um, I've got lots that I can continue to talk about. Um, I might just... Um, I was going to mention that uh, Pope Francis got blown off. Were you aware of that? Now, he lost his couple. Kippa. Kippa. However you want to pronounce it. Have you noticed that the Catholics where some people may call it a skull cap, but it protects the, uh, the crown chakra. Um, and the Pope got his blown off. Don't think it was a choir boy. But I wanted to... Um, what did I want to say to you? Um, Glastonbury headlining. Dua Lipa. If you've paid all that money to go to Glastonbury, would you go, oh, brilliant, Dua Lipa? I literally would be chucking myself off the top of my house. So they've got Coldplay again. Not exactly Led Zeppelin, is it? And they've got another woman doing the Legends slot. Now, Dua Lipa's got a great voice, but the personality of someone who hasn't got a personality... That's interesting, Dan. Why is it the skull cap covers the connection with the sun, you reckon? I reckon it's their crown chakra. Uh, I think it's to protect their crown chakra. Um, Fred, look, Coldplay is, is, is fine. Um, Clocks is a brilliant song, love it. But they're all a bit... I, I like my rock and rollers. Uh, I like them damaged. I like them like genii. I like them to be vocalists to kind of emote. I want to I want to feel it. A bit like when I went to Big Ben on Monday. I stood within three and a half feet of the great bell and literally felt the vibration go the, through the whole of my body. If I was paying um Susie Quattro, who's that you tart? Jim Atkinson. That's funny. Um if if I paid a lot of money to go to Glastonbury, and they said, uh, yeah, we've got uh, uh, a brilliant headline act, uh, Dua Lipa. They're not exactly public enemy, are they? Is she? And there's not been... I mean, I wanted Prince to do Glastonbury because he literally would have done a five-hour set and it just would have been immense. Coldplay? They're not... I just, I, I like rock and roll to just make you emote, engage you. Jim Morrison and the Doors, yeah, brilliant, Sean. And uh, Andrew, at the moment, the best bands I have seen recently are tribute bands. Susie is great with her fans, I'm sure. She'll be some age now, though, Susie Quattro. I mean, it's not really any, like, Lady Gaga, I think Lady Gaga is the last big superstar. Big, big, big superstar. And her voice is golden. But I think she's a bit... Um, she's, she's gone off the rails a little, shall we say. Um, Marina Abramovich. Um, Steve Earle. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you that one. 
but I, I like them damaged. I like them just to kind of stagger out and not knowing what they're doing. A bit like uh, Guns N' Roses, but they're all boys now. They're not proper mad in their in their pomp or their youth. And I, and I want, uh, and the, the job of rock and roll is, or music, is to reflect back to the youth themselves. And we're getting, Humble Pie, what a great band. Um, we're getting artists that are Ed Sheeran, talented, I agree, but reflecting back to the youth, reflecting themselves back at them. It's not punk, it's not the Sex Pistols. And 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 what about um, the Eris tour? No, it's shite, man. It's not Billy Idol at Genie's Day. Had a man, yeah. He, uh, yeah. Saw Guns N' Roses at Monsters of Rock Festival, Donington Park. Oh, I didn't live far from Donington. Um, why can't they get like Deep Purple back? Get Aussie. I mean, I know he's shuffling a bit, but. I was having a conversation with the new Mrs. Allen. <coughs> we went to a local pub and, and she knows my ears get really easily offended. If somebody hasn't quite got it, it's like, you know, somebody sang an Amy Winehouse song. And it was disgusting because Amy just sang it. There was no effort. There was power in her voice and there was no effort in how she sang. But that's why the pros are the pros and they make a lot of money. And that's why record companies make money out of them. Because there's so many people that can sing. <coughs> and in my opinion, there's two kinds of voices. There's the recording voice, which is pristine and precise. And then there's the live voice that you can't really take into the studio. Because it might be a bit raw. It might be a bit off key a little bit but it has the power. And you see all of these great singers, they were effortless in their power. And some people strain. And um, so my, my ears get really easily offended. Um, what was that? There is some, but it's rare. If you want a cheap night out, do see Cast Off Kinks. It's basically uh, Mick Avery with Veteran Kinks touring members. How the heck can Squeeze support heart? Heart, heart, as in middle of the road, pap, heart. I used to have to play them on Rock FM in Preston. I bloody hated playing them because I just thought, oh, is this the best that we can do? Hazel O'Connor, mad, but brilliant. Um, Jonathan King discovered Genesis with Peter Gabriel. There's Peter Gabriel. His voice, effortless. Phil Collins, effortless. But you get some of these... these um, so I was having a conversation with the new Mrs. Allen around and she gets it now because I've kind of, you know, I've taught her the, the, the simple things. And Andrew James, yes, that art. Oh, I feel sorry. Uh, Toya. Now she's doing, she's doing stuff on, Toya Wilcox is, do, is doing stuff on YouTube with, uh, is it Robert Fripp, her husband? And it's brilliant. And you just think, well, why did I think that she didn't have a good voice back in the punk days? Um, her voice is so good. And obviously Robert Fribb is just amazing. Uh, King Crimson, that was his band. Um, Pink Floyd was superb. I agree with you. And, and you, you kind of... There are those that have it and go on to be great. And those that are great, but don't really have it. Um, and I agree with, I think that's Jane, um, today is wearing extremely well. Was that Toya? Uh, still has it so alive last year from Andrew. I, I agree with you. But but back in the day when it was a myth the way, it's a myth the way, everybody was just like, ah. But now you, you, you can't destroy talent. It's like energy. Energy can't be destroyed. It can just change. And Toya's morphed into this great artist, act, actress and, and singer. And, and all, all of a sudden I'm finding myself listening going, that's a bit tasty girl, along with Robert. Bit tasty. Um, Steve Marriott, yeah, absolutely. 
Um, Crisp sauce. That's very interesting. Everything is subdued now. I, I, I agree with you. I mean, I remember seeing the police headline a gig at Gateshead Athletic Stadium. And it was the police headlining, Sting and all, um, during his court case with the, the Daily Mail, from what I remember. And then down the line, you had uh, Gang of Four, you might know or not know. You too were supporting them. You too were the supporting act. And Bono, he was he was proper mad. He they were singing, and Bono just decided to climb up the stack of speakers. And it was quite high. And everybody's like, oh, is he gonna fall? Is he gonna fall? And you could see the stage hands going, Oh my god, man, what are you doing? But it was character. And then there was the beat. I love the beat. Ranking Roger. Definitely not Jonathan Ross's favourite artist. Um, I'll leave it with you. You'll get it in a minute. Dr. Feelgood, Mr. Jonathan. What a great song. Down at the Doctors, Milk and Alcohol. Lee Breer, what a voice that boy had. Wow, I mean, you, it just, it was, it was whiskey soaked, 40 fags, 60 fags, 80 fags a day. And they would just turn up and, God, oh, my word. I remember buying the vinyl. I remember buying, I think, was it Milk and Alcohol that was brown vinyl? Um, Grey Day Madness. Chip, what's that? Grey Day Madness. Is that a song or, a, or an artist that I'm not aware of? Um, but Mr. John Opp, the Dr. Feelgood. God. Uh, Tom Robinson, 2468, Mike the Yeah, uh, look, I was doing my paper round when that was around. I was, I was up in the morning... Um, go to the paper shop, pick me papers up and then go and deliver them. And it was always on the radio when I went into the paper shop. Um, Roachford is brilliant. Never got the recognition. I agree. I, I interviewed Roachford in... Who was he supporting? He was supporting B.B. Uh, King, I'm sure, at Newcastle City Hall. And I went to interview him. Lovely, lovely, lovely guy. Lovely guy, and I agree with you. Didn't get the recognition. What a great voice, Eddie and the Hot Rods. Do anything you want to do. What a song. I just, I mean, some of these songs they just make you want to get up and get into it. And now, Ed Sheeran makes you want to go back to bed. Lou Reed, yes, great song, great uh, vocal rather. When a song is sung well, it can cure any weary soul. I agree with you, Dan. I mean, there's, there's. Um, in Blood Apart, here's one for you. Vinegar Joe. I find... Oh, Vinegar Joe, which was uh, Robert Palmer and Elkie Brooks. Was that Vinegar Joe? Where they were kind of, they were two front singers and uh, and they kind of split up. They went their own ways and, and, and had Robert Palmer. Ro I mean, not um, every kind of people era, not the, the later um, kind of formulaic stuff, but Robert Palmer, what a boy. Um, Adrian, what do you think of Sam Fender? I think he's got an amazing voice. You see, it's that kind of... he It's effortless, Sam Fender. It's effortless. I mean, his range is obscene. Blondie for me, any day of the week. Sean, ah, I agree with you. But um, didn't... Didn't Clem Burke, the drummer from Blondie, play drums for the Eurythmics for a while? I'm sure I kept seeing him pop up with the Eurythmics. Um, Annie Watt, uh, when a voice is real, it can blow your mind out of your skull. I agree with you, Annie Watt. I agree with you. Um, Chris Mundy, I live very near Paul Carrick. Oh, I've interviewed Paul Carrick. Uh, I interviewed him and... Uh, Mike from Mike and the, oh, Mike and the Mechanics, Mike, Mike, Mike. Um, I interviewed them in a hotel just off Hyde Park and I got the train down to uh, King's Cross and this is back, this must have been 88. I had a mobile phone. It was one of those massive big oaky things and um, Louis Samson, what a voice Robert Palmer had. Oh, amazing, 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 amazing. Um, and... I got to King's Cross and I put my stuff down thinking, oh, I need my questions, I need my stuff, I'm going to jump in a cab and get across to the to the hotel. Left me mobile phone at King's Cross. So I felt as sick as a dog and I got there 
Um, and Mike Rutherford and, and Paul Carrick kind of looked at me and I was ashen faced. And, and Paul Carrick said to me, are you okay? I said, oh, I've just, I've left my mobile phone on the floor at King's Cross. I'm never going to get that back. And do you know, Paul Carrick and Mike Rutherford were so brilliant. They were so gentle with me because I, I literally felt sick to the pit of my stomach. Almost didn't do the interview, but I'd been invited down, the, the record company paid, and they were fabulous. So I, I can tell you that Paul Carrick and Mike Rutherford are, are beautiful souls because they literally had empathy for my, for my struggle um, around losing my mobile phone. Sham 69. Jimmy Percy, Whew, I love Sham 69, hurry up Harry, um, we need 80s clubs, oh I agree with you Jip, uh, Dan Payne, AAA, did you start off DJing because of your love for music, well I'm a classically trained cellist, there you go, there's something new for you tonight, a classically trained cellist and I just, my whole being and my ears, honestly I've been blessed with ears that can, that can hear stuff and can, for example, the Beatles, um, and, oh, come on, it was there and it's gone. The Beatles, A Day in the Life. So when the Beatles recorded A Day in the Life at Abbey Road, they were using recording machines with loops. And the orchestra, you know that, boom, final note, right at the end of it, the orchestra were told, don't move. We're recording this and we're sending the sound into one recorder, into another recorder, into another recorder, tape machine, and we're looping it in and out so that the note is extra, 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 extra long. And so the orchestra were told, and my ears, when, when they put it on CD, this would have been 84, 85-ish or 86 maybe, when they were transferring all of the Beatles vinyl onto CDs, you can hear right at the point where they're going, Dong, this long note, you can hear somebody's chair go, eh? and somebody go, shh. And I love that. What, what they've done, I, I don't know whether it's uh, Giles Martin, um, or wh whichever one of the producers, I think has kind of just airbrushed it out. And it's one of those quirky little things it's really special. So, um, <laughs> Chris Mooney said, I like to play the organ. Um, my missus said, I'll go blind. Lose one eye for it. Um, so, a classically trained cellist. So, growing up, my mum was a, was a music teacher. My mum was a, um, had a degree in music, was a piano teacher, literally taught herself. You know, the, the um, accordion? literally picked it up and went, oh, how do I work this? And taught herself with no, like, Wikipedia or YouTube or anything. This is back in the day where you had to buy sheet music. <coughs> taught herself how to play the accordion. And I, I just mesmerised by it. She was incredible. Um, and I kind of got my love of music from her. And that's why I became a nightclub DJ, because it was I was young and daft and and just wanted to play tunes and, you know, dance with girls but then I got into radio and it was all part of that you can hear it you can hear the talent literally spring out of the speaker at you um and and I and when I listen to I can listen to a second and a half of a song and know whether it's talented or not literally drop the drop the needle on the record and the drum beat goes like this um treble Dare double A to play diamond lights on the cello. <laughs> no, I haven't got the haircut for it. Um, Dan Payne accordion. I tried that. Super complex to pick up. I know. But like my mum, she just picked it up and went, ch -ch 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 -ch. like half an hour. Done. Insane. Um, Etta James. I'd rather go blind. Do you know um, one of the million reasons why I, I married the new Mrs. Allen is because she has that talent that my mum had, where of course, she's like multi-instrumentalist, instrumentalist, um, and just picks it up like that. I, I'm just a daft grunt with that decent ears. I can't, I'm not. Um, even my bass playing and my cello, you know, I made grade five on the cello. Uh, I was part of Sunderland Youth Orchestra as a kid. 
And that's where my love of music started. Hang on, while this is going on. Uh, Jane Owen, the accordion is one of the hardest instruments to play. I wish she told me, Mother, because it, it was obscene. It was just like, how did you do that? Well, I play the piano. I yeah, know, that's an accordion, though. It's not a piano. Um, and she took you to try ayahuasca, too. Damn right, Dan. Um, what was Annie Watts saying? Nigel Green, Adrian. Um, I've got a crisis. I ran out of Battenberg and I've only got a, f a finger of fudge. What should I do? Great stuff again, Adrian. A finger of fudge is just enough to wait for the Battenberg. You're wrong. Un. Tesco's deliver. What's, you can get it in, like, um, takeaways now. They deliver. Bless them. Right. Maybe we should... I've done two hours tonight. You're utter wrong. Un. Maybe we should talk music more often. Um, but thank you for um, for everything this evening. Um, maybe we'll do a AAA another night where you can just ask me anything. I'll go through some of the questions, uh, see what you've said, s see your comments, and I'll uh, I'll stick a video up. Um, I've got a couple of ideas that I don't want to uh, kind of give away for other YouTubers to go away and make, but uh, I am up early in the morning creating. Uh, the Orb Overall, great again, Adrian. Thank you for the Orb Overall. Uh, Dave Courtbeak, great show, Adrian. Thank you, Dave. Really appreciate it. And to Rusty Mouse, I'm sliding off the pew. Just don't let the ushers catch you. My name's Adrian. Thank you for your likes. Thank you for getting me over 100. Thank you for your likes, uh, your subscriptions. And please make that you are subscribed. Uh, simply because there's... There's weird things going on. And and I know that people are... Uh, what was I going to say? And how was I going to say it? Um, YouTube is, is looking at... I think what they do is they think that some people are bots. <coughs> so they take the subscriptions away. But they're actually... Um, yeah, Dan Payne says, please like the channel before you go. So I think what uh, the algorithm does is it thinks that some people are bots when they're actually human beings and take them away from the subscription rate. So um, if you've enjoyed the sermon this evening, please make sure that you subscribe to the channel. Thank you to everyone. Lynn, sir, Lynn Turner, thank you, Lynn. Uh, to Jim Atkinson, Penfold, laugh out loud. Who's, who's saying that again? Andy Turner. You're wrong, Andy, man. I'll get a complex. Um, Peter Conway, good night all, and Jane Owen, YouTube are unsubscribing people. I know, because they think it's bots, and it's, you know, AI is not perfect, but they think it's bots. Um, but I, I'm here for the long haul. We'll get there eventually. Thank you for your likes, your subscriptions, but most of all, your indulgence. I think I'm in trouble with the new Mrs. Allen. I've done two hours when I said I wasn't. Um, thank you to everyone, and I'll see you on Wednesday, 8 o'clock. And don't forget, I'm on X, formerly known as Twitter, as at Adrian Allen. You'll find me. Just put it in there. Search for it and you'll find it. Thank you, you wrong'uns. Enjoy your evening. I'll see you live Wednesday.